She picked cotton in the fields of Mississippi, but dreamt of becoming a superstar. I was born and raised on that farm, you know, and that was just about all I could think of, but I wanted to sing. She showed the world that she could and thrilled millions with an often misunderstood classic. I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. Oh boy, you made a big mistake there, Hillary. <laughs> because you're good, girls gonna go back. Her fame and fortune were the envy of millions, yet her private life told a different story. She was a walking country music stereotype. Five turbulent marriages, including a destructive union with a fellow country legend. He turns completely into a madman. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. A terrifying ordeal that left the country music world alarmed. Took the gun in his left hand, opened the door, and pulled me out. And an untimely end that leaves questions unanswered to this day. Emergency 911. The question as far as when she died uh, see, has never really been answered. The tangled life, sensational career, and heartbreaking death of Tammy Wynette on CMT Inside Fame. She was crowned the first lady of country music, but she was also known as the heroine of heartbreak. Her music paralleled her life, equal parts triumph and tragedy, joy and sorrow. Her dramatic personal life fraught with five complicated marriages, upwards of 30 serious operations, and an unsolved kidnapping, often threatened to overwhelm her career. But through it all, her talent overcame each obstacle. For over 30 years, Tammy Wynette's music chronicled the classic country music themes, of loneliness, divorce, and the search for love. Themes she knew and understood all too well. Oh, I wish that we could stop this D-I-V-O-R-C -E. She sang songs about her life um, that helped a lot of women get through the same kind of situations. Even as a kid, I related to those heartbreak songs. Tammy had a uh, just a real genuine ache in her voice but i think it was a beautiful marriage of strength and vulnerability in the south they call that kind of personality a steel magnolia and those are women who outwardly seem incredibly feminine but who inwardly are incredibly strong tammy Wynette's journey to fame included all the usual trappings of one who's achieved the pinnacle of success grammy awards three straight country music association awards for female vocalist an induction into the country music hall of fame but beyond all the accolades and acclaim she never forgot where she came from she was born virginia Wynette pew on may 5, 1942 on her grandfather's hard scrabble farm in itawamba county mississippi it was the deep south cotton was king and money was scarce Wynette, as she was called, started life at the bottom. I defy anyone to go down there and look at that house where she was raised and say, that's middle class. It's not middle class. It's not even, it's not even aspiring working class. It's poor. Her mother, Mildred, was a farmhand and substitute school teacher. Her father, William Hollis Pugh, was a farmer and an accomplished musician who would proudly hold his baby daughter on his lap and sing to her. But three months before Wynette's first birthday, William succumbed to a brain tumor. But before his death, William implored the family to encourage his daughter if she showed any musical inclination, but music would have to wait. Just surviving was a bigger issue, and Mildred headed off to find work in the defense plants of Memphis. Wynette's formative years would be spent in the scorching Mississippi sun, picking cotton in the fields of her maternal grandfather's farm. Well, we did pick cotton. Everybody picked cotton then. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't live out here and not pick cotton. You lug a sack that weighs as much as you do. You're in the broiling hot sun. It's horrible work. And she picked cotton and she remembered. As Wynette grew up, she began to show the musical promise that her father had hoped for. She taught herself to play piano and guitar, sang in a gospel duo with her friend Linda Kaysen, and fantasized about a better life beyond Mississippi. I used to daydream about singing and going to see this person and that person and what it would be like to, to be able to sing with this person. The duet partner of young Wynette's dreams was rising country star George Jones. When uh, George Jones came on the scene, that was it. From then on, that was the only country singer. <laughs> Soon, Wynette blossomed into a beguiling teenage beauty, and young men took notice. However, Mildred kept Wynette under close watch, 
The two argued frequently about Wynette's preoccupation with the opposite sex. When Mildred forbade her to see Billy Cole, the local preacher's son, Wynette was determined to defy her mother. She and Billy made plans to elope. She made the mistake of telling a lot of our friends, you know. And when they found out, of course, they told their mothers. And then Mildred found out about it, and the wedding was off. But Mildred would not be able to derail Wynette's next set of wedding plans. Two years later, in 1959, and only a month shy of graduation, the 17-year-old newly crowned Miss Tremont High and her boyfriend of 10 months, 22-year-old Yupel Bird, eloped to Fulton, Mississippi, against her mother's wishes. I used to think that maybe she married Yupel uh, because Mildred was against it so much, you know. Just as Mildred predicted, the marriage was a disaster from the beginning. She and Yupel fought constantly, and Wynette was forced to take any number of low-paying jobs to support the chronically unemployed Yupel. When the couple separated three years and two daughters later, Wynette swallowed her pride and returned with daughters Jackie and Gwen to her grandfather's farm. There, she persuaded her mother to pay $25 a month for cosmetology school. While studying for a hairdresser's license, Wynette's living conditions became even more primitive and desperate. I was living in a, in a no log house that was owned by my grandfather. She and I collected boxes pasteboard boxes and we actually unfolded those boxes took tacks and tacked them to the wall to keep the wind out. Wynette's life would get much worse before it got better. In 1965 the on again off again union of Wynette and Yupel resulted in her third pregnancy. It was more news than she could handle. She fell into a severe depression and told Yupel the marriage was over. To her mother Mildred the idea of divorce was unacceptable. Women in the South at that period in time still considered divorce to be a sinful thing. In fact, when Tammy left her... seven at night. The TV job led to work in the rundown country bars around Birmingham. Her fledgling music career was gaining momentum, but her extraordinary drive to succeed was always tempered with deep-seated fears. She'd even fantasized about having surgery to have the fear cut out from her. And, uh, she asked me if I thought that meant she was crazy. And I said, no, you're not crazy. You're, just, you're, you know, you're, you're going through some fear. Somehow, Tammy buried her fears deep inside herself and in 1966, after a year of TV and club experience along the dusty byways of the Deep South, she summoned up the courage to head to Nashville. It was time to press for a real music career. I'm sure she had to have been scared, but she was determined. She had a lot of determination. She wanted a better life for her family, and she was determined to make something of it. With her three young daughters in tow, Wynette proceeded to pound on every door she could find on Nashville's Music Row. But at that time in country music, the opportunities were few and far between for what record executives referred to as girl singers. She was facing an industry that was uphill all the way for women, first of all. They're, they talked in those days about having a slot 
at a rate at a record company for a female slot. And I went from one place to the other, uh, asking people to listen to me. I didn't have any tapes. I just used a piano or a guitar, and I just went around singing and heard no, 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 no. After months of hearing the word no, Tammy had just about run out of options. She and her daughters were living in a dumpy $12 a week tourist motel, surviving on cornbread and pinto beans, and she was down to her final few dollars. There was one last door to pound on, Epic Records. One day, I think Billy Sherrill, at Epic Records secretary, was out, and she noticed Sherrill's door was open, and she just walked in with the guitar, and he looked at her like, uh, like, what do you want? She said, I want a record deal. In 1966, Epic Records staff producer Billy Sherrill was the boy wonder of Music Row. He was regarded as a song guy who had a keen ear and eye for talent. When Virginia Wynette Bird sang the first line of her song, Sherrill sensed there was someone unique in front of him. I think he was able to immediately detect the real about her. Billy Sherrill really understood who Tammy was. The first time he looked at her, he said, you don't look like a like a Virginia, you look more like a Tammy. Virginia Wynette Bird was now Tammy Wynette. After signing Tammy to Epic, Billy Sherrill's next step was to find the right song for her debut recording. Within a week, he tracked down a previously recorded song that seemed tailor-made for Tammy. She came by the next day, and I gave her the record of apartment number nine. And uh, she learned it. We went in the studio that night at seven. And when the I heard the first thing come out of her mouth. I thought, God, we got something here. Keep waiting in this lonely room. Listen to it. It's perfect. She harmonizes with herself. The, the delivery, the syntax, the pronunciation, the phrasing, it's all there. She's a fully realized vocalist at, at her very first session. In apartment number nine. Although Tammy's debut single pushed its way into the top 40, any record royalties were still way down the road. Tammy was leading a decidedly unglamorous life when she was befriended by Don Chappell, a divorced singer-songwriter who was making ends meet as a motel night clerk. Chappell boasted a list of Music City connections, including superstar George Jones. In 1967, Tammy and Don were married, even though Tammy later admitted she wasn't sure she loved him. I think it was just a, a way for her to um, have someone to be with. She didn't like being alone. It was like she, she was so strong, and yet she seemed to always need somebody, you know, a man. She needed a man in her life. In 1967, Tammy headed out on the road to build momentum for her next release, and Don demanded to be included. Even though it was Tammy with the hit record, Don insisted that they be billed as the Don Chapel and Tammy Wynette Show. It wasn't long until Tammy chafed at her secondary billing as Don's girl singer. I'm sure it was stressful because they were on the road a lot, you know. I just remember um, hearing them arguing quite a bit. Although her married life wasn't bringing Tammy much happiness, her recording career was a different story entirely. I don't want to play house. 1967's I Don't Want to Play House went all the way to number one. The song's lyrics seemed all too real when it came to Tammy's life. She had that ability to draw you into her songs because it sounded like, even if you didn't know her, it sounded like, boy, she's been there. That, that tear in her voice, that little catch that was always there, just kind of made people, I just got shivers because I remember, I remember how her voice affected me. The tear in Tammy's voice may have been more than her singing style. Just as her career was taking off, there came a crushing and painful blow. Don had developed a hobby of snapping photos of Tammy when she was jumping out of the shower or getting dressed. Unbeknownst to Tammy, he had been swapping the pictures with men whose names he'd found in porn magazines. Tammy learned the truth after a show one night when she was presented with the entire collection by a fan. Nude photos, yeah. It was a bitter pill for her, you know. Even though she was in the public, she was a very private person. Devastated by this act of betrayal, Tammy vowed to escape her marriage to Don Chappell one way or another. Coming up, like a knight in shining armor, George Jones comes to the rescue. I said, well, I love her, and I think she loves me too. And like something out of the final scene of The Graduate, George Jones and Tammy Wynette fled into the night. And later, Tammy struggles with a desperate addiction. It was horrible. It was a 
slow death. It was a horrible way to live for four and a half years. When CMT Inside Fame continues. By 1967, Wynette Bird had transformed herself from a destitute Birmingham hairdresser into Tammy Wynette, a rising country star who was being hailed for her unique voice and heartbreaking song delivery. But in spite of her career success, Tammy's personal life was once again on the brink of bitter disappointment. Her husband's practice of swapping nude photos of Tammy with other men had pushed their relationship to the breaking point. As her second marriage unraveled, Tammy became an object of fascination for the superstar she'd fantasized about since she was a young teenager, country music bad boy George Jones. George Jones uh, took an interest in Tammy and began to uh, arrive unexpectedly at some of her performances. At first, Don thought nothing unusual about George showing up on the road. He'd recently written a song that George recorded and the two of them had become casual friends. But when George appeared out of the blue at a gig in Alabama, he had more in his mind than just saying hello to Don. George asked his road manager to take a message to Tammy. I said, just slip the word to her that I... I know she's married, but, uh, but I love her still. That was an old song, you know. So I was to get my message to her and just feel her out. And it wasn't about 20 minutes she was over at the bus. The affection that had secretly been growing between George and Tammy became very public one night in the summer of 1968. Tammy and her husband Don Chappell invited George to dinner at their house. Don had no idea of the feelings George had been holding in for so long. I had a few drinks too many <laughs> time I got there and, and uh, her husband at the time started uh, fussing at her and calling her bad names and loud tones and what have you. And didn't sit right with me for some reason. I just turned his table over and he said, what is your interest in her? I said, well, I love her and I think she loves me too. I said, don't you, Tammy? And she said, yes, I do. And like something out of the final scene of The Graduate, George Jones and Tammy Wynette fled into the night. A day later, the new couple flew to Mexico City to get Tammy a quickie Mexican divorce. They were two great stars falling in love. It was a storybook romance thing. I mean, he was at the top of his game. She was the hottest new thing in, in the female ranks. Tammy was hotter than hot. In 1968, she hit the top of the country charts again with the aptly titled D-I-V-O-R-C-E and won the first of her three consecutive CMA awards for Female Vocalist of the Year. She then went back into the studio with Billy Sherrill and ended up writing and recording the song that would define her entire career. I'd been working on a song for a year, at least. I called it, I'll Stand By You, Please Stand By Me. I couldn't say Stand By Me because Ben E. King had a hit called Stand By Me. To me, it did not have a pretty melody. I, I didn't like it. I hated the high notes that I had to hit on it. Stand by you, man. Give him two arms to cling to. But Billy Sherrill knew a hit when he heard one. Stand By Your Man rocketed to number one on the country charts, and then in 1969, crossed into the pop top 20, where it battled it out with such rock luminaries as The Doors, Marvin Gaye, and The Bee Gees. It's one of the greatest singles ever recorded by anybody in any field of music, in my opinion. One of those records where, where the song, the production, the singer, the arrangement, all those things were really unique. Hey! But the song's lyrics brought a hostile reaction from the late 60s feminist movement. 
they interpreted the lyrics as a call to return to the bad old days when women were second-class citizens expected to endure the oppression of men. There were a couple of lines in that song that really rubbed feminists the wrong way. One of them was the, that saying, you'll have bad times, he'll have good times. Um, and the notion that uh, you'll forgive him. After all, he's just a man. I don't think she was trying to be controversial. I think she was just saying in that moment, you know, times get tough, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by this. And I also think you have to look at things from, um, from how she was raised and, you know, where, what she was coming from when she was saying that. The controversy did not harm Tammy's career. In fact, it served to establish her as a household name. As Tammy basked in the glow of national notoriety, her divorce from Don Chappell was finalized. George and Tammy were finally able to marry and tied the knot on February 16, 1969. Although Jones had a reputation as a hell-raising boozer, Tammy successfully persuaded him to clean up his act, at least for the time being. I think like many women, she thought she could save him. Many women think that they can take a, a guy who's got problems and, and heal him. To escape his Nashville drinking cronies, George and Tammy left Music City and moved into an antebellum estate in Lakeland, Florida. Jones adopted Tammy's three girls, and in 1970, when their daughter Georgette was born, the royal couple of country music was overjoyed. While it looked as though Tammy's home life was finally falling into place, her failing health made it difficult for her to enjoy it. Tammy began experiencing pains in her abdomen that could only be curbed by powerful prescription medication. When the pain became unbearable, she underwent emergency surgery, but it was only the beginning. But I had my first operation when Georgette was just a baby. Um, I had an appendectomy, and after that I formed very bad scar tissue adhesions. As Tammy dealt with her emerging medical problems, the couple became one of the biggest acts in country music. And then, after two short but idyllic years, George slipped back to his bad habits. He was, he was volatile when he was drinking. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He turns completely into a madman. He just, he liked to play with guns and he would shoot guns in the middle of the night. In 1974, Tammy gave George an ultimatum. It was either her or the bottle. To give their marriage a fresh start, they moved back to Nashville and settled into a 17,000 square foot, 12 bedroom mansion. Again, George was on his best behavior for a time, but again, it wouldn't last. I got off the wagon and got messed up. I didn't want to go back to the house. So the next, I waited till the next morning and I gave her a call and, and it's, I said, I'll be there in a little bit. I'm, I'm sorry, I fell off the wagon. Well, you never heard such cussing in all of your life that I got. And she said, you'll never step foot back in this house. And I didn't. The most celebrated union in the history of country music ended in divorce in 1975. They went through everything you can imagine to go through. Um, and in my opinion, still loved each other. Coming up on CMT Inside Fame, Rumors of a hoax swirl after Tammy claimed she was kidnapped. It's the most frightened I've ever been in my entire life. Well, there were people looking at the, the pictures of her in, in the Tennessee and in the banner and saying, well, why does she have that spot of shoe polish on her cheek? Is that a br bruise or is that shoe polish? And later, an international dance hit cast Tammy in a brand new light. This is a woman who once campaigned for George Wallace, cavorting in a video with half-naked black men. When CMT Inside Fame continues.
By 1975, Tammy Wynette's biggest hit was seven years behind her. She'd been riding the George Jones roller coaster for eight years. George and Tammy were trapped in the public eye, both as a famous couple and as a hugely successful recording act. But when they divorced in a flood of recrimination and disappointment, Tammy was on her own once again. When it came time to breathe life back into her solo career, Tammy Wynette was filled with self-doubt. I cried for months thinking, I can't do a show. I even called Billy Sherrill. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Up until this moment, she's a singing stick who just stands there, and it's his show and his band, and she's like the window dressing. When the divorce happens, she has to stand on her own two feet as a star for the first time. Tammy was determined to rebuild her career with a new attitude. To freshen up her stage show, she hired four members of the Gatlin family, and in June 1975, the Tammy Wynette Show hit the road. Thirteen people crammed into one tour bus. It was it was a tight-knit little group. <laughs> As the tour crisscrossed the American heartland, Tammy began to gain confidence, both as a solo artist and as a single woman. She spent a lot of time with her backup singer, Rudy Gatlin. Gatlin was 24 at the time, Tammy 33. I think those were the happiest times of her life. Um, during that time, she, she cared very much about Rudy Gatlin. There was a love there and an affection and a respect for one another. The Wynette Gatlin romance set tongues wagging in Nashville, but when she was linked with movie star Burt Reynolds, who she met on a television talk show in 1976, it was national news. Many were shocked by the unlikely union, including Tammy herself. She didn't think she was attractive, she didn't think she had anything to offer, and, uh, and, and she was, couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, she was, um, she was the whole package. He was exciting to her. He was um, very gentlemanly. He cared about her. She cared about him. Tammy was living her single life to the hilt. She bought a beach house in Jupiter, Florida to be closer to Bert, and while in Nashville, continued to date Rudy Gatlin. Tammy evidently had no shortage of admirers, but in 1976, a string of bizarre incidents made it clear to Tammy and her family that not everyone wished them well. And people would call and make threats about mom or about one of us, uh, my sisters and I. We'd come home and someone had put red X's on the front door. They had taken lipsticks and written on TVs and mirrors and glass all throughout the house. Tammy and her family tried to ignore the acts of vandalism for as long as they could. Then, on May 25th, 1976, Tammy and Rudy Gatlin returned from a date at the movies to find her house on fire. It was clear that Tammy's life was in danger. That was my first thought. They've, they've crossed that line and somebody's here to do some, some harm. The fire department found three separate points of ignition at the house. But after a full investigation, no arrests were ever made. Those closest to Tammy at the time have speculated that the arsonist may have been someone who knew Tammy well. Shortly after the fire, her relationship with Gatlin cooled off and Tammy began seeing real estate developer and man about town, Michael Tomlin. It was a whirlwind courtship, and after their third date, Tomlin proposed marriage. Tammy said yes, much to the concern of her family and friends. I, I think it was a surprise. I, we didn't, I don't think she really knew him. She wanted that loving relationship with someone, always looking for that. I, I mean, it sums it up in the song. I'll just keep on falling in love till I get it right. So I'll just keep on Falling in love Till I get it right By August 1976, after being together for a mere 44 days, Tammy filed for an annulment from Tomlin. In her pleadings, she alleged cruel and inhuman treatment. Tomlin categorically denied any such conduct. Eventually, the ill-advised marriage was dissolved on December 22nd, 1977. I don't know why Tammy had such bad luck with men. You know, some women are just cursed that way, and, you know, I think that Tammy was probably one of them. But Tammy's love life wasn't her only problem. During 1976, she had been hospitalized eight times and endured three more abdominal surgeries. To top off her medical problems, Tammy was becoming more and more dependent on the prescription pain medication she was taking. I was taking an awful lot of uh, pain pills because I had chronic pain all the time and couldn't get rid of it. Despite her growing health and medication problems, and although her recording career had cooled off, 
Tammy continued to be a major concert draw and kept up an exhausting pace of sold-out shows. There are times I know that she wished that she didn't perform when she was sick and that she would have rather have just been at home resting. But for the most part, I think she really was driven to sing and to perform because she loved it so much. All the times I've fallen victim to my pride. She was absolutely sensational. She walked out in a beautiful face and the blonde hair and hit the first note and everybody was ready. She'd just stand there and sing and you'd just think, my God, is she singing that? She's not even moving. It always amazed me how she could just get all that out and you'd never even know there was any effort put into it. It was just so natural for her. Singing may have come naturally to Tammy, but being alone did not. Within a year of her divorce from Michael Tomlin, Tammy was being romanced by an old acquaintance. George Ritchie, a producer and songwriter who'd had a professional association with Tammy for years, was interested in taking their friendship to another level. We started talking about getting married. And she asked me if I would... Actually, will you quit what you're doing and take over my career? That, in essence, was the question. I realized uh, pretty soon into the relationship that I liked him more than... Uh, I probably should have at the time because I was just jumping from uh, frying pan into the fire. So I remember her coming and telling us and in a way I think I was relieved and I thought, well if this is the one that's gonna make you happy then, you know, that's great. Tammy and George Ritchie were married on July 6th, 1978. The union began with high hopes, but the honeymoon was short-lived. On October 4th, 1978, less than four months after the wedding, Tammy told the press a bizarre story. She claimed to have been kidnapped from the parking lot of a Nashville mall, transported 80 miles south to Pulaski, Tennessee, then beaten and left in a farmer's field. He took the gun in his left hand, opened the door, and pulled me out from uh, the other side of the car, and we were in the middle of nowhere, and it, you know, I just thought, well, you know, this is it. There were people looking at the, the pictures of her in, in the Tennessee and in the banner and saying, why does she have that spot of shoe polish on her cheek. Is that a bruise or is that shoe polish? It's all so bizarre. Why would you transport Tammy Wynette from point A to point B and either not rob her or, or, or harm her in any way? Once again, as was the case of the mysterious break-ins and fires of 1976, after a protracted police and FBI investigation, no arrests were ever made. After the Fuhrer died down, Tammy's daughter Jackie said her mother admitted to her that the whole incident had been a hoax. Her and Richie had gone into an argument and they had um, come up with this story to cover up an argument. Mm -hmm. This was a story that was made up because he had beaten her. She'd wound up with a bunch of bruises and she was supposed to be performing uh, very soon after that and she needed some way to explain why she was all bruised, you know, with black eyes and everything. George Ritchie, however, maintains he had nothing to do with the abduction and was astonished with Jackie's accusation. I thought it was a joke. Tammy's life gradually returned to normal, and over the next several years, Tammy and Ritchie were never far apart. When you left, you said just doing me a favor. In 1982, at age 40, Tammy staged a well-received top 10 comeback with Another Chance. But still, she was plagued by an ever-increasing reliance on prescription painkillers. And by 1986, that dependence was starting to affect her work. Tammy Wynette needed help. One night after a show we did, I believe we were in Laughlin, Nevada at that time. She was starting to have, she still did the show, but when she came off stage, it's, you know, it, it was hard to stay focused. I got to where I thought, well, I'll take a pill and I won't hurt, and then I can get through the show. And then it, got, it plays mind games with you. In 1986, Tammy finally realized that her dependence on prescription painkillers was out of control, and she was admitted to the Betty Ford Center. I really had felt like Mom had taken the steps that she needed to take and was getting better, and... Then I think um, she kind of was foiled, really, because she got sick again in the middle of that recuperation and ended up having to have surgery. So she was never able, able to complete the program. It was right back into the same thing. Coming up, Tammy's mysterious death shocks the country music world 
and raises suspicion. Emergency 911. We've had a death at 4916 Franklin Road. Is this by chance Tammy Wynette? Maybe something was up with her death. Maybe something went right. When CMT Inside Fame continues. There's no one that I can blame Oh, but how my world was changed The 70s and 80s were decades of extremes for Tammy Wynette. She'd enjoyed the very pinnacle of success in country music. But unfortunately, this period also saw Tammy haunted by turmoil, failed marriages, suspicious unsolved arson and kidnapping cases, and an aborted attempt at drug rehab. As the 90s dawned, 48-year-old Tammy Wynette longed for some peace of mind. Instead, she found more conflict. In 1992, Tammy was inadvertently drawn into a controversy with the future First Lady of the United States, who was defending her husband on 60 Minutes. You know, I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. <laughs> we sat up the bed and said, what? <laughs> Why is she dragging me into this, you know? I think Tammy Wynette was upset legitimately on a couple of points, although I can't read her mind. I did read what she said. And one of the things she said was, tell me where in the lyrics of this song it says a woman's supposed to be a doormat. It was the wrong thing to say. And they demanded an apology and got it. Later in 1992, Tammy was about to be viewed in an entirely different light when she was approached to record with the British dance music sensation, the KLF. They were the biggest pop dance act in the music business at the time. The seemingly bizarre pairing of Tammy Wynette and the KLF resulted in a number one hit in 18 countries and hit number 13 on the American pop charts. This is a woman who once campaigned for George Wallace, cavorting in a video with half-naked black men. I mean, that's how far she came in her life. Tammy followed up her pop success with a return to her country roots. In 1993, she took part in an album project entitled Honky Tonk Angels with old friends Loretta Lynn and Dolly Parton. wonderful opportunity to do the trio album with uh, with uh, Tammy and Loretta and that was one of the greatest thrills of my whole life. It was an unbelievable experience. Just unbelievable. Dolly was funny, Loretta was cute, Tammy was elegant and sophisticated and just uh, belting her brains out. But on December 28, 1993, just as Tammy was enjoying another round of success, she was rushed to the hospital in desperate pain. A severe bile duct infection threatened to poison her entire body. She ended up in the hospital and um, was on a ventilator and was very, very, very ill. I was told that she had a 10% chan chance of surviving. Uh, I know I was just that far from, from dying, but I felt no pain, and I felt no fear, no anything. So uh, I think it's probably God's way of telling me Death ain't no big deal. A mere two days after being released from the hospital, Tammy was back at work. She then launched into the recording of a reunion album with ex-husband and former duet partner. Gotten her off of that killer schedule she was on. By 1998, Tammy's health was failing fast. The years of surgeries and endless cycle of pain medication were taking a devastating toll. It was a very, a very sad thing to see her deteriorate. She was such a great lady. I was always fearful, especially the last couple of years, of getting that phone call, which, which eventually came. On Monday, April 6, 1998, 
Tammy and her husband, George Ritchie, had spent most of the day sleeping on a couch at their home. According to Ritchie, he awakened at about 7 p.m. and immediately turned to check on Tammy. I looked and I said, oh, yeah, she's fine. And I happened to look again. And I thought, is she okay? I then touched her and realized that I thought she was gone. Emergency 911. We've had a death at 4916 Franklin Road. Okay, was it an unexpected death, sir? Uh, it was kind of unexpected. We have been getting several calls, and I'm not going to put this over the radio. Is this by any chance Tammy Wynette? Tammy Wynette, one of the greatest country singers of all time, had died in her sleep at the age of only 55. Three days later, on April 9, 1998, saddened fans and music industry insiders alike gathered at Nashville's Ryman Auditorium to remember Tammy in a heartfelt memorial service. While we were saddened and shocked, I would say maybe not surprised, because she had been so sick for so long. Um, and now it wasn't too long after that that all of a sudden these rumors started floating around. The controversy that had surrounded Tammy all her life continued in death. Tammy's daughters raised questions about the actual time of death, why the medical examiner wasn't called, and did the powerful pain medication their mother was taking have anything to do with her death? There were a lot of things that apparently didn't add up. Uh, a lot of things that seemed suspicious to Tammy's daughters. And they started pushing for an autopsy. George Ritchie fought against the idea of an autopsy, saying it was against Tammy's final wishes. But in 1999, when Tammy's daughters launched a wrongful death suit against him for $50 million, Ritchie reluctantly gave his consent. I'm very saddened that part of Tammy's legacy is this fiasco. I was brokenhearted. I had lost Tammy, and I felt I had lost four children that I had raised. The autopsy results were released on May 20th, 1999. Medical examiner Bruce Levy ruled that Tammy's death was a result of heart failure, and further, that the contributions to her death from diseases and medications cannot be ascertained. I think she deserved better than she got in life, and I certainly think she deserved better than she got in death. Um, I think Tammy would be appalled. I think, you know, the way that everything went down after she died, I think that Tammy would have just hated every second of it. And if you think you got it made, and his love will never fade. Tammy Wynette has taken her rightful place in country music history as a woman who overcame unspeakable loss, fear, and heartache to become an entertainer whose remarkable voice continues to inspire millions. And she's a For many, she remains the standard by which all female singers are judged in country music. A unique voice that when you hear it forever you will know that it's Tammy Wynette. I loved not only her voice but the way it cracked and the fact that it was full of uh, life, like life's experiences. Nobody sang with that cry, nobody put, to me, nobody put that much uh, emotion into their songs. She is a great, great singer. And I say is, not was, is. 